Welcome to the simplicity of happiness when more is too much. This podcast offers tips and techniques for a better life. And before we start with another episode of the Simplicity of Happiness podcast, I would like to remind you that you can find out all about me and my thoughts on simplicityofhappiness.com as well as Patreon, where I am providing extra content for all of you who support me and the education of children in Africa. And now relax and enjoy the show. Welcome back. And, well, look forward for this episode because I enjoyed it a lot. Although I don't necessarily go align with that concept of introvert versus extrovert. Um, because I know a lot of people that seem to behave like extroverts, but they are not actually sharing their deepest thoughts. And they have some aspects of being an introvert as well. And I think that extrovert versus introvert in most cases is somehow a mix of a behavior. Most of all, it's the question what gives you energy. Me time or, well, you time. In any case, I want to let you know that from uh, this episode on forward, I am going to uh, publish an episode only about twice a month. Um, I figured this summer that I am much more happy with uh, going with the quality versus the quantity. And um, therefore, well, for the time being, it'll be about every two weeks. I hope you enjoy this episode and hopefully talk to you next time. Well, hello and uh, welcome back to another episode of the Simplicity of Happiness podcast together with John Baker. Um, hello and welcome to the show, John. Good morning, Flo. Yeah, thank you very much for welcoming me. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> and you can tell directly I am talking to a uh, person with an English accent, <laughs> so no American, which <laughs> makes it so much easier to schedule the call and not so much of an extrovert, are you? <laughs> no, absolutely not. So very much of an introvert, um, which is quite interesting for many years, I'll be honest, like most of the population, I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, and then when I did begin to understand, I looked back over my history and I went, oh, wow, it's existed for a long, long time. My, my behavior patterns have been very, very similar. But So no, I'm certainly an introvert. And um, about, about two years ago, I was that fascinated by the coaching I've done over the last 15 or 20 years with business owners, franchisees, that I started to look back at where I was getting the best results, which was when I was working with introverts. So as of that time, I was restructuring my entire life anyway, and I decided I'm going to specialize in introversion. And I'm quite curious why you moved to the coast, because as an ocean lover, um, mm -hmm. who's just about to go south and um, and work on my boat on Elba. Um, I'll come back to that um, in a minute. There's one question I have up front. In your interpretation, what is an extrovert and what is an introvert? Ah, uh, okay. So I think there's, I mean, people talk about all sorts of things in here and I think it leads to lots of ridiculous myths, some of which I can understand, some I can't, but I'll give you, two things that I find incredibly useful when it comes to understanding introversion in a business context. The first is, I say, energy, by which I mean people energy, where an introvert will tend to be de-energized when they're with lots of people, or and the more people or the less they know those people, mm -hmm. the, more, the quicker that de-energizing takes place. You probably remember, Flo, a number of years ago, the old Nokia 3310 phone. 
Perhaps you're too young, of course, but it was, <laughs> it was one of the yes, things. Yes, because I, I just remain 25. It doesn't, <laughs> I don't go with the time. Um, it was one of, it was I one of the never early... liked Nokia. So I heard the number, but I never owned ah, Nokia. Okay. So but I think the essential point was it was one of the very early mobile phones. And I think at that time, Nokia was one of the market leaders. But yeah. it doesn't really matter because I think most of the mobile phones at that point suffered the same thing. You charge it up quietly while it's sitting at home or in the office. And then, of course, you unplug it and you start talking with it. And the battery would just suddenly go and disappear. And introversion is very much like that. You never quite know how long the battery will last, but it charges up quietly on its own. And when it starts talking, when you're with other people, the, the people energy, if I could put it like that, disappears. So that's the first of the, the two things I take talk about. And there's... There's actually some scientific background to this one as well, but I'll come back to that one if you really like to later. The second one I often talk about is processing, by which I mean internal processing or external processing. Mm -hmm. Introverts, if you ask them a question, they tend to stop and think in their head. And they're trying to think of the most complete, the best, the most accurate answer before they speak. And I call that they think to talk. Whereas an extrovert very typically will do the exact opposite. They talk to think, ask them that question, and words just fire back out of their mouth straight away. Now, neither of these is wrong or right or better or worse. They are, of course, very different. And they have lots of implications, as does the energy thing, for people in business and for people in general life. Does it mean that the longer we talk, the lower your battery goes? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so I better yeah. hurry up. <laughs> ah, yeah, no, thanks, bye. Um, no, in all seriousness, the, the interaction, you, typically introverts quite enjoy in-depth conversations with one or two people that they, they know and they get on with, there's a good connection with. So it's not that introverts are antisocial. It's not that introverts have social anxiety or they're shy or anything like that. It's an energy thing. And that's, that's where one of the myths comes in, because a lot of people talk about introverts being shy. And the, the two are very different. So a shy person doesn't like to talk in public or, you know, or they are slightly timid or they are very, very fearful or, or at the strongest impact, of course, they'll have social anxiety. Um, I can understand you could be a shy introvert. And of course, that would make it very difficult for you because mm. not only are you de-energized, you don't like talking in public, or you don't like talking with groups of people. Equally, and this is the one that messes with most people's heads, you can be a shy extrovert. So I've got a friend, Michael, who is a shy extrovert. And I know, it just sounds weird. About, well, it was about a year before COVID all kicked in, in the days when we could go out to dinner with groups of people and chat about business and it was called networking it's an introvert's kind of idea of hell generally but michael convinced me to go to a networking dinner one evening and i knew that it was going to be the end of the day i knew my people energy would be low because i'd been with a client all afternoon and i didn't really want to go but he was very persuasive so i, I go to dinner and i'm sitting at dinner chatting away to two or three people either side of me and I can feel my energy just draining away and just but I'm there and I'm talking because that's what you do so not a problem there's no it's not a confidence thing I'm just chatting away but I can feel my energy draining Michael on the other hand is there and you can see him almost growing and glowing as he soaks up the energy from people around him however He's doing everything he can to actually avoid talking. So it's just really weird, but he's a shy extrovert. Mm -hmm. So the, the, anyway, the, the two are different. So there's many, many myths about introversion. We could talk about those for forever more, but your basic question was about definition. So I think there's the people energy and the, the processing. Do we think inside our head or do we think by talking? And do you think that most people are either way? I think that's one of the another one of the myths. You are either introvert or you're extrovert. And the answer is it's a spectrum. And you know, the, the closer to the extreme ends you get, the fewer people you have. And as you get towards the middle, you've got more. But depending on whose numbers you look at, I think there's about 
between 30 and 50 percent of people introverted um, somewhere in the middle is probably 20 or 30 percent or even more uh, as it depends on where you put the cuts off between introvert and ambivert or ambivert and extrovert but i often for for making it easy go 30 40 30 so with about 40 percent somewhere in the middle because in usual or in in, in general i usually don't talk about introvert or extrovert in uh, in the coaching because I um, I basically don't care what the label is called. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking people what um, so what makes you happy, what helps you, what serves you, and often people who are typically referred to as extroverts, they if you talk to them, they say, well, I'm. Maybe I'm talking a lot. Maybe I seem, but I most of the really important stuff I, I, I reference internally. So they say, well, I'm actually not so much of an extrovert. I just maybe just play an extrovert. Interesting thing yeah, so I think the interesting thing there, Flo, is that labels, <clears throat> labels are, well, they're both brilliantly useful and incredibly dangerous. So mm -hmm. a label can be really good at giving you a quick diagnosis, which might help you to select a couple of tactics or strategies to help you change things. So if you know, I often talk to introverts and uh, I'll sit there and say, well, here's, here's a little acronym you could use that will help you. And I'll talk about it with you later, but I call it STOP. Now, that's only going to really help if you go, oh, yes, I'm an introvert. However, when labels become dangerous, it's when we go, I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert and therefore I can't do this. Well, that's just, I mm. don't know how, how many rude words I can say. So that's oh, just as not, many as you like. <laughs> that's just not right, is it? It's um, just because we choose a certain label, that doesn't mean that this makes us happy or that makes us happy. We can or can't do certain things. We can choose to do things, but we can still be an introvert or an extrovert. And I think that's, that's, the, that's why labels are both very useful and very dangerous. It's a bit like deciding to make a cake. So if I open my cupboard, there's some boxes and each of the boxes has got a label on it. And I know that with certain ingredients that come out of the boxes, I can make a cake and different proportions of those ingredients will make a very different cake. Yeah. But the labels are useful because I can grab the right things quickly. But beyond that, what I make with them is completely up to me. And how did it help you to give yourself that label? Mm. Okay, so by understanding that I have some introvert tendencies, by understanding I'm an introvert, I could start to make sense of the fact that, as an example, um, when with a lot of people I'm, I'm tired, many introverts say to me things like, uh, I feel really bad about myself because of the way I feel when I'm with people. I feel really bad about myself because I get tired and I want to, don't want to spend time in groups of people. I feel bad about myself because I'm quite slow when I'm responding and answering questions. Now, I felt like that a few years ago. And the first time I realized it probably was about 25 years ago. I'm on a training course. You know, one of those things where you go for two or three days, it's a work, work thing. And there'd be overnight accommodation and in the evening. So during the daytime, it's not so bad. It's work. So I can sit in the course. I can interact normally. But by the evening time, I just want to chill out. I've had enough. I've had enough of being with people. But because it's a course, you all have to go to dinner together. And there's a social expectation that you all sit in the bar and chat. And this is my worst nightmare. Small talk going on. And I feel at the time I used to do this regularly and felt really bad about myself. Why don't I enjoy it? I must be inferior. I must be bad because of this. And I was chatting to one of the trainers and he explained to me about the people energy thing and introversion. Suddenly I had a, a label, if I come back to that, which meant, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not unusual. I'm one of 30 to 50 percent of the population. And lots of people have that in different degrees. Well, that's fine. And having accepted that, I stopped worrying about the myself and the way I feel, and I can go on building it. So that's where, for me, the label 
became useful. And that's how it was useful, because I could then say, right, I'm an introvert. This is all these symptoms are not because I'm deficient, they are because I'm an introvert. Introvert has lots of strengths as well as weaknesses. Great, get over it, move on. Anything you changed after that? Yeah, so over the years, as I studied it more, I, started, I, I come up with this, this acronym, which I'll come back to if, if I can put it like that, which is STOP. And the first thing I say is to introverts who are in the position I was, is STOP means stop worrying about it. And that alone can help a lot of people. Suddenly, oh, it, it, it sounds really strange having the conversation and somebody goes, oh, oh, I'm normal. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. And you can see the, the load lighten and they become happier, as indeed I was when I first come out. So stop for me, the first part is stop worrying about it. The S of stop means focus on your strengths. And introverts typically are very good at detail. Typically, you know, that, that works well for them, but focus on your introvert strengths. The next thing is be aware of time. So that's where the T of stop. If I know that I'm going to a conference for a couple of days, as an example, I will now book, if at all possible, the day after the conference or even two days after the conference, no work at all or no work with people, because I know that I will be absolutely shattered Mm. mentally drained by having all these people conversation and um, i used to run a run a large group of 100 or so ex- mainly extroverted people in london i attend on the saturday great it was great fun but on the sunday I, i'm about as u- much used as a as a chocolate fire guard mm-hmm. imagine how useful it is when as soon as it gets warm it melts and i just sit there on the sunday uh, and then i realized it because i was exhausted so Create the time for yourself, if possible, afterwards. If you can't do it afterwards, try and make the the effect slightly worse. So I will take time out during the day. So if I'm in a conference and I'm back to back with meetings with people and lunchtime, I'll go, right, for half an hour, for 20 minutes, I'm going to escape, walk around, make myself happy by being in the countryside or, or even walking up and down some streets, but just some time alone just so I can re-energize. So the T is for time. The O is for orient. Orient yourself and other important people around you about the fact that you're an introvert. So I often talk about a friend of mine, Ben, who has a who is an introvert and he's a very extroverted wife. And this is what used to happen. He'd come in for the end of the day and he'd be exhausted because he's been working with people all day. And he'd just want to sit quietly, process his thinking about the day in his head, and then having regained some energy to chat. His wife would come in, also having worked with people all day. Yeah! He'd bouncing off the ceilings, all excited, and like a true extrovert, just wants to talk about all the things that she's been doing. And of course, that just meant the two would be crunching up against each other. And there was causing them some difficulties. And I was chatting to them one day. And I said, it's really, really simple. One of you is extroverted and the other is introverted. And we, once they oriented themselves around that fact, they started to understand each other a bit more and they just dealt with it differently. So the final one is P for position. If, and most of us in business in some way, have at times got to go and spend time in large groups. So, you know, Come back to that that thing I, I was telling you about the mm-hmm. networking thing that I go to on a Saturday with a hundred or so extroverts. If you get yourself a position in that group, it becomes a lot easier. So I joined the team that helped run the organisation. So at least when I'm talking to people, I've got some kind of official position. It makes it much easier to join in the conversations. And as an introvert, that's that's fairly useful. But it's also gave me an official reason for leaving the conversations, which is incredibly useful as an introvert, because quite often it's like, I'm feeling de-energized with this conversation. I need to go and take two minutes away. Oh, I can't do that. I feel bad. But actually, because I've taken a position, I've got to go and talk to some other people or I've got to go and organize something. And so suddenly it becomes a lot easier. And one of the 
tips that I've, I've picked up from inter- interviewing many introverts is they all tend to get themselves roles in organizations like that so that they are able to come in and out of conversations with people and suddenly they find it much much easier so that's where the stop acronym comes from Mm -hmm. and and that helps a lot of introverts to 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 get more out of work working life i guess is the, the right way to put it and in your daily work not daily work daily life what what makes you happy Brilliant. I love this question. So as I look <laughs> Why up, do you love that question? Because I think one of the things that we all focus on too much is things that are not important to us. I think too much time is spent by too many people focusing on, I don't know, KPIs or work or whatever it might be, rather than why are we actually here? What as human beings are the things that we can actually do that improve our lives? And that's about making ourselves happy. So I think it's a fundamentally important thing to focus on if we're going to, you know, in the time when mental health gets lots of discussions, when all sorts of issues get discussed, people don't focus on being happy enough. Um, so as I, as I look out the window there, I, I've, got, um, I've got lovely flat, calm sea with the, the sun reflecting and the ripples on the waves. Um, so lots of green trees around and the other side of the bay is some white cliffs. So incredibly pretty just for me just looking out there but what makes me happy is going out and enjoying that especially being in the water on the water and even better under the water so you go diving yeah in absolutely england. <laughs> in england in england in new zealand in egypt anywhere in the world i'll, I'll go and dive so okay I've, I've done, new zealand and egypt i could understand but what is there to see in england well there's lots actually so let's say uh, 400 meters down the along the road to me i can get onto a boat or i can just get under the the local pier and under that pier there's all sorts of life. There's many, many crabs. Quite often there's some lobsters. There's different fish that change colour. There's, um, I can't think of the name now. I can, I can picture the fish. Um, no, it's gone. Uh, fish, they, have, they change colour and they've got funny little tentacles and they wave them around. Octopus. Cuttle, cuttlefish. Um, ah, yeah. And there's a, a huge abundance of life that's just sitting around there. But to me, more importantly, just being in the water, it, the first thing you do, you start to relax. And if you relax more, you enjoy the diving more. So first of all, I find now, as soon as I'm in the water, under the water, I automatically start to relax. As soon as I relax, my breathing changes. And actually, it's one of the things that scuba divers are most aware of, of course, because you're carrying around everything in this tank on your back. And I relax, I suddenly start to become happier. If I've been, put it another way, if I've not been in the water for a couple of weeks, I suddenly start to feel (laughs) a bit um, tense. Whereas I can spend spend an hour or two under the water. I just just find I, I relax a lot. But come back to your question, what is in the water? Huge numbers of fish. Sometimes the visibility isn't as good as it might be in Egypt. So in Egypt, maybe commonly you'll see for 30 meters away in the uk five six meters away but that doesn't mean that there's not some great stuff there and of course the other thing in particularly around where i am i'm on the south coast of england there's a huge number of wrecks varying from relatively recently there's 20 year old one that's not that far away from us to there's some old wooden well, basically they're piles of wooden beams now they've collapsed that much but it's in a lot older ships not only are the, the wreck shipwrecks interesting in themselves again they become a haven for lots of life around them whether that's whether that's fish whether that's crabs or whether that's incredibly pretty corals as well with lots of color Well, the way you describe this, I truly believe every every sentence you say. So um, uh, talking about um, uh, um, 
how much how much curse words are we allowed to say i would say this does not sound like bullshit it sounds like something that you truly enjoy Absolutely. um what do you think from your personal perspective is more important to have a, a fulfilling job or a fulfilling private life well i think actually you have to have both Mm. Um, what is the difference between the two that's that's where i'm coming to with my point <laughs> so i think i think you have to, well to say you have to have both clearly not because at some point most of us stop working and we can still be very fulfilled in our private life so ultimately it's about a balance between the things that make you really happy and feel contented and and feel i know for me I need to spend the time in the ocean. I need to spend the time in nature because that clearly makes me feel relaxed and happy and, and, and good. But equally, I need to I need, I need to use my brain. I need to be engaging with, with some kind of sensible mental processes. Sometimes that might be coding, coding uh, Visual Basic behind Excel and all sorts of things. But for me also, I need to be doing something useful for other people. Quite often people have said to me, John, what is it that makes your, what, what makes a great week for you? And my definition is really, really simple. If I'm having a conversation, whether it's a conversation like this one, whether it's as I was last night, I was sitting uh, on the bar, in the bar with, with two new next door neighbors that just moved in and we were just sitting chatting, or whether it's a client that's paid me to go and work with them for the day. But if I'm having a conversation, suddenly they have what I call a light bulb moment. Oh, something I've said has really helped them. At that point, I'm happy. At that point, I go, great, I've, I've done something useful for humankind. I've added to what I often refer to as the, the, the human consciousness. Uh, I'm not an individual person. I just think I've added to something positive overall in the world. And if I have a one or two of those in a week, I'm like, great, yeah. So... Do they have to be at work? No, but generally they are. And that's why I say I think both work and private life are incredibly important. And I think it's more to the point, it's about them being combined. I get that some people have to earn money and the only way they can earn money is doing jobs they don't particularly enjoy. I'm very lucky. I've created my life around a job that I really enjoy. And therefore, to me, to start to, to blur together, let's both positive and negative by the way they blur together so it's great and i'm really happy at the same time occasionally it can be eight o'clock in the evening and i'm i'm really excited i'm writing a new blog or i'm recording something and I suddenly realize oh it's eight o'clock i should have stopped work because i'm neglecting some friends but mm -hmm. you know it, life is about balance i think but coming back to your question it is private life or work life it is definitely both to me and i think Ultimately, it is about what makes you happy and what makes you, to, to me, it's not just happy because I think it what fulfills you and what, what allows you to add to the happiness of others, what allows you to add to that human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Nice. So what are you doing when you well lose the focus lose focus on happiness you just mentioned the the extroverts um it seems to be uh quite simple they just go out and meet some other people <laughs> and get their <laughs> energy um but when you are on your own working on a certain project and you get stuck you get frustrated The weather isn't great for, for, for scuba diving. What is a secret tip of yours to, to move yourself up? I think that we need to... Life to me is about creating some, some useful habits around us. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll, in fact, I'm not told this publicly, publicly before. So I'll, I'll just come pick, pick a little element for my, for my life. A number of years ago, I was not in a very good place. So that's, this is, this is the label that goes with the story. Mm -hmm. And I, I was on what I called the red diet at the time. So I, yeah. the red diet. So during the day, 
I was absolutely tired. I was in a bad place. But to make myself able to work, I drank lots of Red Bull. So the, the energy drink. And then because I've been drinking Red Bull all day, come the evening time, I'm like, <laughs> I can't sleep. And also, I'm now sitting alone, no work colleagues, no nothing, and I'm pretty depressed. Um, and so I would then, the second part of the bed diet was red wine. So I'd then sit in front of the television, drink the red wine, and that helped all the thoughts in my head to go away and just became blurry. And also I'd watch rubbish on television for the whole evening in the hope that it just numbed everything. And eventually I'd fall asleep, normally by about... I don't know, one or two in the morning, I suppose. But the interesting thing was that I, as I'm sitting there on the sofa, I'd pile all the cushions. Unconsciously, I'd pile all the cushions around me and on, almost on top of me. So the only thing coming out was my head poking out so I could see the TV. And then I'd eventually drag myself up to bed and I'd wake up the next morning and go, I need to make myself happy. And I couldn't. But because it was the morning, because I had a bit more energy, yeah, okay, I can do this. And I walked downstairs, walked through the living room, and instantly I'd see all the cushions all over the floor and all over the sofa, and I'd start to beat myself up and feel bad. And so the cycle began again. Now, I know that talking to you, Flo, you can immediately see what's going on here, and every other rational person in that I've ever told the story to can immediately go, John, it's really obvious. But believe me, at that point in time, I could not see it. Most of the... Big struggles that people have are obvious to the outside world. Absolutely. And well, as as I as I suppose that we have one or two listeners, um, that is the secret behind coaching. I mm. personally think it is. I mean, even me. Sometimes I need an external view, mm. because from from the outside, they can see the obvious. But if you are Like um, if you're locked up in the cage, what everything yeah. around the whole world looks like behind bars, mm -hmm. although it's you sitting in the cage. And sometimes it's so helpful if somebody's from the outside and if, if it's then yeah. a good coach who's not telling you what to do, but who's leading you to a different perspective that can change yeah. your life no matter who you are so yes <laughs> so, it, so, uh, it so. looks obvious to the outside but the secret is how to find it and and i would like to um to add another question to that mm. um, um because people who are more external have a stronger external reference um the moment they struggle maybe they search for more conversation or more other people um, and maybe they can drag them out of there but if you're an introvert and if you are like reflecting everything inside your own head mm. what is maybe there's one or two listeners say well I have these two or three things and I, I, I don't tell my partner I don't tell my boss I don't tell anybody else because I make it up with myself and they are locked inside that situation mm. for way too long What is the suggestion that you have? Well, I think, I think so I'll, I'll come back to the, the cushions for a moment and then come yeah, back to your yeah, question. Yeah. So, so what I learned from that is the obvious thing. It took me about three months before I realized that what I needed to do was tidy the cushions up the night before. Ah, shock, horror. I started to develop, to develop a habit. And this is the key thing. I, my, first, my first habit was to put the cushions back before going to bed. And I'm not going to claim that that fixed my depression. Of course not, I'm not that silly. But it was a very key turning moment for me. I consciously chose, and I think the most, most powerful word in the human language is I choose. I chose to do that. And therefore, from that moment forwards, with lots of other things as well, I started to improve. And I think this is the, the that's what happened to me there. And I started to then add other habits. And I think the habit thing is the really important thing. People often say, which I fundamentally disagree with, ah, oh, you've got goals and the goals are what make you. And I think that's complete rubbish. A goal by definition is something you don't have. You can't be something you don't have. You can want it, but that's not the same. But things that you do regularly, repeatedly, 
i.e. your habits, are who you are and what you are. So I think the answer is that we need to create our own success habits, the ones that are really important to us, and then keep executing them in, in the right way. So the first of mine was my, my cushions. Now, one of the other ones, if I find myself locked in a room, locked in my head, thinking too much, I have a buzzer on my, my phone. And every hour and a half, it says, get outside and go for a walk. That's become a habit. I know for me, and it might not do it for you, Flo, but for me, that helps to lift my mood a bit. So I make myself do that. Even though I might not want it, I've programmed a way that something externally goes, knock, knock, Mm -hmm. get up, go and do a walk. Um, Whatever the habits are. um, Another one I've got, I've got more than one friend, I hope, but I've got a number of friends that I would call close <laughs> <Let's> friends. <ask> them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, even introverts, by the way, have friends. Even introverts like socialising. And so one of the things that I, I would do is I'll make sure that I've had a good discussion or spent time with, not two minutes, hi, how are you? I'm fine, bye. But to have spent time with some of my close friends and close business contacts as well. But... The point being, it's about quality time where we discuss things in detail, which is something that introverts are very good at doing. Introverts tend to like that detailed conversation, that the in-depth thing, rather than a kind of small talk, hello, what's important, hello, blah, 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 blah. Introverts tend to much prefer that. And so I will make sure I've got my checklist. Have I spoken? Have I caught up with important people? And very often, introverts also say to me, business networking really hard doesn't work for us and i sit there and say well i know a number of introverts that get a huge amount from networking but when most business owners talk about networking they think of meetings with 60 or 70 people at lunch and at dinner. once <laughs> yeah um but that's not networking that's a meeting networking to me is here's my closest people that can help me to achieve my objectives So from networking, my objectives will be to get more business, get a certain type of business, get a certain amount of business. And then I can say to myself, well, who is is most able to help me to achieve that? Now, I can make sure that I've had regular, detailed, uh, when I say detailed, that's not the right, in-depth discussions, connections with each of the people on that list, which is an introvert skill. And introverts, therefore, can network because I don't need to go and shake hands with 500 people and talk loudly and talk nonsense because that's I know that's not going to help me as an introvert. But by focusing on the important people in my network, by helping them, I feel good because I'm helping them by having in-depth conversations and talking about ways we can help each other. My network can help me as well. Mm-hmm. And so it's very similar for the for the social thing as well. But so coming back to your question about what helps me, what, what tips would I offer? That's so a couple of them. One is whatever habits make you, you know, whatever you need to do to make you happy or to at least lift your mood a bit, program that into your day. Program in some socializing with the important people in the amounts and the way in which you want. So some people might struggle if I said, Go and spend all day with your best friend. But actually, there's no reason why you can't make sure you've had a a good conversation on Zoom or Skype or phone or go for a walk with, whatever it be, with a friend once a week or so. Where there's no agenda, you're just chatting. I had to think of one metaphor for um, these... um, for for the water people (laughs) among (laughs) among us. Um, You said... What is the goal? The goal is the place where you are not. Mm-hmm. Um, when you go sailing, um, because when you're driving a car, very often you are just, I mean, you are you are bound to the road. You can't just go mm. wherever you want. Mm. But when you're sailing, um, you just you you pick a point, maybe a random point, but a place where you want to go. What I had to think of is in your private life, like if you have a goal, 
And if this is all you do, you have that goal, that's like sailing and you look on the map and you have this one point and then you, you start sailing, you, you do something. And then you're like, where's the point? Where's the point? Am I here? No, I'm not there. I'm not there. The only thing that helps you is that you get a direction. Mm -hmm. Because if you just start searching for that point that you see on the map, it will just remain a point on the map. But what you can translate to this is, so what am I about to do? I'll set a direction. And when I have a direction, I can check if I'm going in the right direction. And I love that flow because- And if I'm of... not, then I can readjust. Mm. And so for example, if I have the, If I have the habit to always steer too wide, too, too far to the right, um, if I look at my goal, well, I'm still not there. <laughs> so it doesn't make a difference. But if I look for, look for my navigation, for the direction that I want to go, I can see. So all of a sudden I can see that the habit that I have is, that, is not getting me in the direction. Mm. So I, you can adjust the habits, which is bringing you to the direction. And yeah. all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're crossing the Atlantic, it, it's going to take you 21 days or longer. Mm. So um, being not there for 21 days is quite frustrating. But knowing from one day one on that you go the right direction can be satisfying. Yeah. This is why I'm, I'm sure. not looking for, I'm not looking for the goal. I'm looking for, well, a navigation with yeah. my coaches. And, and I completely agree. And I, I often, I've often stood up in front of a, a group of coaches and given a presentation and I say, goals suck. Get rid of having goals. And it really upsets them all. But yeah. the basic point I'm making is exactly what you've just been saying. What's a goal? It's something we don't have that we do want. So what are we doing by thinking of goals all the time? We're focusing our efforts on something we don't have, which immediately for some people makes them feel worse. But what I can say is exactly what you said. If I head in the right direction for where I want to go, whether I get there all the way or not, doesn't matter. Every step I take, I'm somewhere better than I the was. Right direction, yeah. yeah. So it's it's about this, direction. I call this the compass in life. Mm. So I don't do goal setting with uh, people I work with, but work on their compass. What mm. is your compass? What direction does it point? And are you moving that direction? Because that way you can celebrate every single step. I, I had, had an interesting, um, uh, when I started this whole conversation series on the podcast, my first guest was uh, uh, Tony. Well, somebody with a very English name, Anthony James Owen. <laughs> oh yes, that and sound um, uh, yeah, he he is he had an English father, so he's ha half English, and um, he used to live in a in a Japanese um, monastery for two for two years during his karate uh, time, and which doesn't happen very often. I lost my point. <laughs> <laughs> I have to look at my I, I have to look at my compass again. Oh yeah, you see that easy. Um, and he said there are I have a, a many conversations with him and he said there are goal people and there are flow people. And some people they are happy going with the flow and there are other people that need to be motivated by the goal. And mm. it seems like I'm a goal person. I always want to achieve something. But the stronger I tried to achieve something, the more often I felt miserable because I was either not there yet or I was already there. Mm. And when, the moment you reach your goal, you lose your goal. Yeah. And I didn't manage to celebrate reaching my goal because the, the moment I did it, I felt empty and without orientation because I did not know where to go now. Mm. And with that moving in the right direction, I know, I mean, even if, I'm, even if I want to go on that mountain, if I know the direction, I know, okay, I'll be on the top, I can enjoy the view and I still know which direction to go. Yep. 
so well, this is just a a, a little a little side story. <laughs> but, yeah, but, uh, you but I think it's in, for that. But it's an incredibly important side story, Flo, because I think again it comes back to the underlying piece about what are we here for. And I think we hear, first of all, I, I get that some people might be motivated by goals, but there, there's far too many people who say their goal is to have a fast car or to earn a million dollars or euros or whatever. And that's bullshit. Sorry, most of us, very few of us are actually motivated and that's what we really want. Normally, we want what the million dollars will do for us. We want the lifestyle that goes with it. Yes. So that's what the first, first point. But... Actually, I am not allergic to money. <laughs> no, I've got no it's problem with money. Fine. It's what it helps me with. Yes. I mean, okay. So I think the, the key point is, what is it that you really want to achieve? What are the feelings that you're trying to unlock? And what direction do you want to go in to achieve that? Now I can create a habit where every day I'm heading in the right direction, which means I'm happier already. I'm doing things that make me feel good. What do you think? Uh, what you are here for? I'm here. For, I'm here to help other people, and th I've got no lack of clarity around that. I feel good when I'm when I, as I said, that that light bulb moment when suddenly goes, oh wow, yes, I feel great when I do that, and they clearly feel good as well. And in my world, that's what I'm here for. I think. Actually, that sums it up. That's a very good. That's that's a very good way <laughs> to to end our conversation, um, because it uh, it can leave our our listeners with that question: What are you here for? Mm, great question. And yeah, you can break it. You as a listener, you can break it down for for yourself. So, what are you here for? And what is the direction that takes you there? And what are the habits, the daily habits that keep you on that road? Mm. Well, John, what is a good way uh, if people want to find out more about you? Okay, so my website is introvertinbusiness.co.uk. Really, really straightforward. And there's lots of resources there for for introverts, but more particularly for business leaders and managers who want to get more from their business, more from their team by understanding introverts much better. Yeah. So it's either for the introverts or yeah. those who are dealing with introverts. Correct. So not many of those then. <laughs> well, um, John, thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed that, uh, that conversation and um um, well, maybe one day I can sail you to a nice scuba diving spot because I prefer to be above the water. That <laughs> sounds so brilliant scared. to me. Um, is there anything I can do for you? No, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I felt enlivened by it. So it's been really good to engage with ideas that hopefully your listeners will, will really enjoy as much as you and I have enjoyed swapping yeah. those ideas well then thank you for your time and uh, keep in mind if there's anything that i can help you with drop me a note and um, i hope to meet in person one day not too many other people around us <laughs> absolutely i look forward to it thanks Flo. yeah john thank you very much 